Hi class, today we're going to talk about what are called sequential games. So a great example of this is what's called truel. All this is is a duel between three people. So if you've ever seen the movie The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, you'll know that the final scene ends with this very dramatic standoff between these three people, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so this is kind of the situation that we were talking about. If you haven't seen the movie yet, please educate yourself in some Western cinema. This is the classic Western. Um, you, you really must watch it. It's fantastic. Okay. And so what is this truel that happens at the end? At three people. Good, bad, and the ugly. All right. And everyone's trying to kill everyone. And so how does this game work? Well, they have two goals. Their primary goal is to live. All right. If you die, obviously that's the worst outcome. But there's a secondary goal, and that is to be the only one alive. That there are as few people as possible at the end. They're fighting over this big treasure, and the more people who are dead, the fewer people need to split it. Okay, and so what are your choices? So you can either shoot or you can not shoot. And we'll assume that each person only has one bullet. I think this is probably a fair assumption. Even if they had multiple bullets in the time that it would take them to reload and take another shot, right? That's sort of a whole other game. Okay, so let's think about what if this was a simultaneous game? That is, everybody makes their choices at the same time. Just like we've been studying these types of games like rocks, paper, scissors, um, like making a smoothie, choosing a restaurant. These games that we've been playing have all been simultaneous games. Well, then what will everyone do? Well, in that case, it doesn't make sense not to shoot. Everyone is going to shoot. And why is that? Well, whether you shoot or not, right, it doesn't affect your primary goal. If someone's going to shoot you, they're going to shoot you. If they're not going to shoot you, you're not going to get shot. But it does help you achieve your secondary goal, where there's fewer people left at the end. So you have no control over your primary goal. But shooting helps the secondary goal. All right here in this scenario, where they all fire at the same time, looks like this player is the only one alive. Okay, but not all games are simultaneous games. For instance, you might have a slight millisecond to react to what another person's choice might be. And so, in reality, a lot of games aren't made, the choices aren't made simultaneously, they're made sequentially. So let's think about what would happen if this were a sequential game. So you could sit there, and you could tell, did somebody shoot? Did they shoot at me? Did they shoot at another person? And you can make your choice after that. So your choices are made sequentially in the, in the row. Okay, so say over here we got Clint, here we got Eli, here we got Lee. Okay, now how did we analyze this game if it's a sequential game? What we're going to use is called a game tree. We're going to write out the sequential choices. And we're going to attach the payouts at the end of each of the string of choices. Okay, so let's just list the payouts that we could have in this case. We could have one, two, three, or four. One is the worst, the fewest points. And so you're going to get a one if you die. Okay, and it, otherwise you're alive. And how do you get more points? We get more points if you're the only one alive. So you get four points if you're the sole survivor, three points if, if there's one other person alive, 
and two points is uh, if everyone else is alive. Okay. And let's just make some assumptions. We'll assume that Clint is going to choose first. And if they're still alive to choose, then Eli will choose. And then Lee. Okay, and so on and so forth. They'll, they'll cycle through the three of them until the game is over. Okay, so the first thing we do to make a game tree is we write out what Clint's three options are. So, Clint could choose not to shoot, or Clint could choose to shoot at Eli, or he could choose to shoot at Lee. And what would happen in each case? Well, let's see, Eli shoots next, but if Clint shoots Eli, then Eli's dead. So it looks like Lee will go next. And what can Lee choose? Lee can choose either to not shoot, or he could choose to shoot their last person, who is Clint. Similarly, if Clint shoots Lee, then Eli goes next. And Eli can choose not to shoot, or to shoot the other person alive. Okay, and so let's suppose that Clint shoots Lee, and Eli shoots Clint. Then what's the payout going to be? Well, Clint is dead, Eli is alive, and is actually the sole survivor, and Lee is also dead. So we'll list the points in sequential order. This one will be the first player, the second player, and the third player's points. And here we're assuming that Clint is the first player, Eli is the second player, Lee is the third player. Now what if Clint shoots Lee, but Eli decides not to shoot? Then who's alive at the end? Both Clint and Eli are both alive. Both Clint and Eli are alive. That's the first and the second person. The third person, Lee, is dead. And so they're both alive with one other person left. So the scores will be 3, 3, and 1. Now we can do the same sort of analysis if Clint decides instead to shoot Eli and Lee decides to shoot Clint. Well then, Lee is the only one alive and the other two are dead. So the scores will be 1, 1, and 4. If Clint decides to shoot Eli and Lee decides not to shoot, then both Clint and Lee will be alive, and Eli will be dead. So the scores will be 3, 1, and 3. Okay, let's leave out the score for don't shoot for a second. Now, how do we analyze this? Well, we're going to use what's called backwards induction. To analyze people's choices, and inform our own. So let's take a look at Eli's choices. Eli can either not shoot anyone, or he can decide to shoot Clint. Now, remember, Eli is the second person, so he's choosing between don't shoot, which gives him three points, or to shoot, which will make him the lone survivor and give him four points. So which one will Eli choose? Well, he gets more points if he shoots Clint. Right? Clint has shot, Eli, uh, shot Lee for him, so if Eli shoots Clint, finishes him off, he's going to be the sole survivor. So which of these will Eli choose? He will choose to shoot Clint. He won't choose not to shoot, because that's giving him a lower payout. Okay, what about Lee? Well, Lee is the third player, and so he's comparing these scores in the third slot, and similarly to Eli, if Lee doesn't shoot, then there's going to be two people left, and if he does shoot Clint, then he'll be the sole survivor. So again, his payout is larger if he shoots Clint. And so what's the idea, and what makes this tool so tricky, is that if you eliminate one of the characters, then the other character is just left with themselves and you, and they're going to take the shot at you, because you're the only one left standing. And so Clint realizes that if he shoots either Lee or Eli, he's going to be shot himself. 
So, Quint then should choose not to shoot. Because if he doesn't shoot, then he at least won't get shot himself. And what will other people choose to do? Well, if Quint doesn't shoot, then Eli will also follow suit and not shoot. Because Eli realizes that if he shoots anyone, then the last remaining person will also shoot him. And so on and so forth. So if Clint decides not to shoot, then in fact, everyone will stay alive. If everyone is alive, then they all get scores of two. So now, Clint can look at his three choices. If Clint chooses to not shoot, he'll end up with a score of two. If Clint chooses to shoot Eli, he'll get shot himself and end up with a score of one. And if Clint chooses to shoot Lee, he'll get shot by Eli and again end up with a score of one. So now which of these scores would he prefer? Two, one, or one? Well, he'd prefer that two. At least he stays alive. So he would not shoot Eli, he would not shoot Lee, and he would choose himself not to shoot. And this in turn would make everyone not shoot. So why was this called backwards induction? Well, we looked from the bottom of the tree, from the last scenario, to see what would the character making the decision choose in each of these scenarios. And by thinking about what would happen in the future, Clint can think about what he should do now. He knew that if he shot Eli, it would eventually lead to him getting shot, similarly if he shot Lee. And so he could compare the payouts of those future choices, right? Maybe this one looks okay here for Clint. Oh, I could get three points. Three points is better than two. Right? But by analyzing Lee's decision up here, to, whether to not shoot or shoot Clint, Clint can realize that if he, he has no hope of getting that score of three, because that branch of the tree has been cut, it's been snipped off, because Lee will never make that decision, because out of Lee's self-interest, he will shoot Clint. As just a graphical demonstration, suppose Clint first shoots Eli. Right? Well now, it's Lee's turn, and there's only two of them left, so of course Lee will shoot Clint. And Lee will be the sole survivor. Likewise, the opposite is also true. If Clint shoots Lee, then Eli is the last one. Eli and Clint are the last two. And so what will Eli do? He'll shoot Clint. Eli will be the last one to stand. So this scenario, the fact that this is a sequential choice, is actually what leads to the standoff. People wonder, oh, you're sitting there, why don't you just shoot someone, right? Why are you just staring at each other? Well, they realize if they take a shot at someone, then the other people are going to have enough time to shoot them back. The scene is fantastic, the drama is great, very intense, I won't spoil the ending, but you should go watch the movie. It's fantastic. Okay. All right, so let's go again go over backwards induction. Okay, you start from the bottom, start from the end of the ends of the tree, and see who is deciding at that branch. So, for instance, this branch over here, we see that Lee is the one who's deciding. And then so we'll compare Lee's scores for each choice to decide what he's going to choose. So we go and we remember that Lee's scores are written third. So we compare these two numbers there. And since 4 is bigger than 3, we snip that branch off the tree and we realize that Lee will choose to shoot Clint. So we'll remove the less desirable options. Similarly up here, right, we looked at Eli's score. We compared those. Those are in the second entry. And again, since 4 was bigger than 3, we realized that Eli would shoot Clint as well. And we clipped that branch that said don't shoot. Now we want to move up a level in the tree. And essentially what's happening is that we realize that this score is going to be guaranteed 
if Clint gets to this part. And we realize that this score here is going to be guaranteed if Lee gets to that part. So if we want to, you can even just draw them in. Well, this will be 1, 1, and 4. This one will be 1, 4, and 1. Right, because that's a logical next step if Clint goes down that branch. And now Clint can go and compare his scores at this branch to decide which one is the best. And that leads to us clipping both of these options in favor of don't shoot. Let's write that down. So you move to the next layer up the tree and you compare the new decider's options at that level to decide what their choice will be. You bring the scores up in the lower layer and then compare those for the new chooser. Okay, so a lot of games can be modeled as sequential choices. And we've also taken a look at how we can analyze games that are simultaneous. And so this has been sort of a brief introduction into kind of the broad world of game theory. People have been doing really, really fantastic, really interesting research in this field. Uh, it's still an active source of research nowadays. People are trying to figure out how can we find best strategies, how can we find, how can we generalize these ideas to huge, larger games, right? This game was a three-person game. This is the first three-person game we've ever seen. You can imagine as you involve more players and more choices, things get more and more complex. And so this sort of basic analysis in this two-person, two-choices cases, these can be expanded upon. And you can imagine how understanding game theory can lead to understanding things like how geopolitical tensions can arise and be solved, how things like the stock market can be analyzed and played, and things like even how sports teams should play against each other, right? how you should have pitchers go in against batters who should be well matched up against whom. These sorts of complex decisions can be analyzed from this perspective of game theory and give us a good idea on how to proceed. They're tough questions, but if we have the right tools, we have the right background and understanding, we can try to make informed, educated choices about these things. All right, well, thanks so much for listening. Um, this is the last lecture for the semester. Um, congratulations to everyone. Thank you for sticking it out through this online learning experience. I know it's been probably very tough for you. Uh, it's definitely been tough to transition myself so thank you for your patience. Thank you for your hard work. Um, we will have a review day on Friday, so I'll be posting a review packet uh, that you should take a look at and we can ask questions about on Friday. Otherwise, good luck studying for the final. Good luck studying for all your finals. Um, really, again, congratulations for making it through the semester. Take care, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, have a nice day.